Hey, how are, how are you today? This is Josh Patrick, and you're at the Sustainable Business in our second Facebook Live simulcast for the day. And my guest for this segment is Dean Sayokis. Did I get that right, Dean? Uh, Sukis. Sukis. Dean Sukis. Boy, I have no brains today. I'm sorry. It's Dean Sukis. <laughs> And uh, Dean has got a really interesting company called McGill Loans. I got that one right. Yes. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start the podcast recording. We're going to go on for, oh, uh, 22, 23 minutes with that. And then my bet is we are going to continue on afterwards for a while because Dean's got some really interesting things to say. And uh, you're probably going to want to hear them. So we're going to start the podcast now and off we go. And by the way, we won't be taking any questions or answering any questions while the podcast is going on. But if any questions appear, we will answer them after the podcast is over. <clears throat> so here we are and we're going to start. Hey, how are you today? This is Josh Package Patrick and you're at the Sustainable Business. My guest today is Dean Sukas. Uh, Dean is a really interesting guy. We just spent a couple of minutes talking. He's the founder and CTO of McGill Loans. He bills himself as a technophile. I hope he's more of a technophile than I am a curmudgeon, which is how I bill myself. <laughs> but uh, he's got lots of interesting stuff. He has got a JD MBA from Columbia University, which means he's a really smart guy. And he's taking a look at the lending business in a different way, a very different way, actually. The way he described to me, McGill is a dating site for people who need to borrow money. So we're going to learn a lot about that. We're going to learn about what it takes to be a good borrower and why you should be good look, looking for good lenders. And my guess is we will probably morph into lots of other different areas when it comes to, rather, um, to credit. So let's bring Dean in and start the uh, the conversation. Hey, Dean, how are you today? Very good, and uh, thanks for having me. And uh, nice to meet you a couple minutes before we started here. Yeah, this is always fun. I, I one of the things I really like about podcasting is I have gotten to meet some of the most interesting people that I could ever imagine meeting, and you appear to be one of these guys. So tell me, I don't often do this, but I want to start out because I'm really curious about your company. Tell me about McGill Loans. Sure. Well, uh, McGill Loans uh, was started by myself and a friend of mine, Chris Meyer. Uh, our kids are actually classmates, and that's how we met. We're not uh, longtime friends. We've been friends, you know, we met in the last couple of years. And um, it basically, we started the idea over lunch. It sounds, you know, like one of those cliche stories, but that's what happened. Went to lunch, we had the idea, and uh, we were talking about business, and uh, that was the spark. So, um, what does McGill Loans actually do? Well, when we were having lunch, uh, I'm a real estate developer by trade, and uh, Chris is a business owner. And it was actually Chris who had that day been going um, like he normally does to refinance one of his, his companies, one of his buildings. And he went to a bank and had gone to a couple banks to get quotes. He wanted to compare one bank to another. He wasn't trying to go to just one bank. He wanted to see what his choices are. And over lunch, he was saying, this is taking way too much time. All I need to see is I'm trying to do an initial search and get some, uh, terms, not a binding term sheet, but some lay of the land as to who's interested in this type of a loan on this particular day. And to his dismay, his favorite loan officer had moved to a different bank. Uh, one bank, you know, gave him the runaround and, and the story that we've all heard before. And I said, why are you doing that? And he said, well, what are my choices? And I said, well, I'll just go to the office, find you a search engine. And we'll find a way that you can narrow the field. He goes, well, that would be fantastic. So I went to the office, and for the first time, I couldn't find what I was looking for. I literally couldn't find it. I just couldn't. <laughs> and there were things that purported to kind of give it a, a lay of the land, but upon not even deeper inspection, just very barely scratching the surface, it was pretty clear that it was not for us. Um, and us being... A businessman who have had loan experience in the past and we have banking relationships that we value and work hard on 
but not every loan that we do fits within the profile of our bank. So where do you go? Well, that's a good question. And actually, you brought up a bunch of cool um, questions around banking. And, uh, you know, I, I love what, you're, what you guys are doing because I think it's a really interesting and needed activity. Here's the question that I have. Most business owners, when they go out and they look for a loan, they talk to one bank at a time. Correct. And in my opinion, that is a gigantic mistake. It is. And the problem is you don't have a whole lot of other choices. And you and I are both old enough. And if the viewers can see us, you can tell that we're old enough to remember the days. I, I love cars. Cars is one of my, it's my, um, my weak spot when it comes to cars. And um, everyone in the office gives me a hard time about bringing things back to car examples. But this is a relevant one. We both remember the days of shopping for a car. And your parents would throw you in the back of the car, no seat belts, with your brothers and sisters. You know, that's something that would get you put in jail today. But, of course, back then it was the norm. Uh, we go to the car dealer. Why? To see what they had. There was no way to know. Did they have a blue one? Did they have a red one? We take it for granted today that we have these wonderful tools at our disposal to check inventory of one thing or another, whether it's a car or a DVD player or a television or just even toilet paper. I mean, you can check inventory without leaving your home or your business, and you know the answer to your question before you arrive. Well, that didn't happen before. You go to the car dealer, and they basically would time suck you so that you wouldn't leave. Why? So that you don't go to the other dealer, which you had to get in the car to go. Right. And so how, how do you compare? By the well, time the kids start screaming in the back, your dad probably said, oh, I wanted a blue one. For, I'll just take the red one. Right. And the banks, in my opinion, they're not doing it. It's, the, it. it's the history of the banking that got us to this point. But here we are today, and we have to do it with our feet, and we have to do it with the phone, and it takes a lot of time. And if you're a small business owner or any business owner, for that matter, large, small, if you're running your own shop, you're the president, the CEO, or the decision maker, do you really have that time to get four good proposals? I think that most business owners only get one proposal. Whoever says yes first, that's who they choose. And then even worse is if you have one proposal and that one person said yes, you never got a second. Right. We both we both know what happens during the process. Stuff comes up. There's concern over a K one you have. You have a partnership interest in a partnership that you forgot about. It was ten years ago. Uh, something unimportant can become important. So what happens if after a month of going through this process of underwriting, it doesn't look so good? So the, the my suggestion always is, and I, I like what you guys are doing better than the way I used to do it was I say, go out and find three community banks. I'm a big fan, by the way, of community banks versus the money centers for businesses that do under $100 million, because frankly, I've almost never seen them had to go to a money center bank unless you're borrowing you know, 40 or 50 million bucks. And if you're under that level, they don't care anyhow. But um, if you go to three or four community banks, and start negotiations with three or four at one time, you're likely to get a better deal. Now, your system of allowing me to go online and just go pick, 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 pick seems to make more sense to me. Uh, we, we agree because um, ignoring for a second community banks that by uh, charter or by a decree have to stay within a certain locale, Banks are licensed by the state. It's a state license. So is it possible for a community bank in Los Angeles legally to give me a loan for my owner-occupied building in Sacramento? Well, the answer is yes. But how could I in Sacramento even have the inkling to call a community bank in Los Angeles that I don't know the name of, I've never heard of, I have no relationship with, and simultaneously, how would that banker in Los Angeles who has capacity in their portfolio for exactly my loan ever find me. It's, it's two ships passing in the night. It's never going to happen. So does your system take into account 
banks in industries, meaning that certain banks like certain industries and they dislike yes. other industries. Yes. Our system takes all that into account and that's what makes it super efficient because you as the borrower, me, us, us, everyone on the show is probably a borrower. I'm a borrower. We built it from a borrower's perspective. We're not bankers. Um, we don't know when you go to the bank, if it's a bank that you're not intimately familiar with, how do you know what their uh, affinities are? It's not in a neon sign on the door. Uh, you may think that they, you've heard they've done a lot of industrial loans or you've heard they've done a lot of office loans, but that's not a scientific experiment, right? That's not, that's not accurate. So since that type of information is too voluminous for any one person to synthesize, how can we do it? I don't, I'm not quite sure there is a way to do it, frankly. And there, is, there is now. It sounds cliche, but there is now. Yeah. And, and in fact, I would say that less than 5% of business owners even know banks either red line or green light industries based yeah. on their experience. And where I think Magilla becomes uh, really interesting, um, you know, Magilla works very, very well for the loans that are in the sweet spot. So if you're a borrower who's in that sweet spot, you, we get asked this question all the time. Well, what do I need Magilla for? I'm in a sweet spot. I know I can walk into a bank and get a loan. So what do I need you for? Well, because you should be an educated and informed decision maker. And if you're going to go to one bank because you know you can get a loan from that bank, we don't know if that's a good decision. But the same person may go home after going to just one bank and may spend, what, an hour and a half on kayak? With the minutia of the trip with his wife or partner to, um, to Hawaii to save what? A couple hundred bucks? If that. But we just went to one company, in this case a bank, a vendor, Right, they're a vendor. They're providing yeah. a service. By, you, by the way, that's all a bank is, is a vendor. You, yeah. You, business owners, please stop putting your bank on a pedestal. They don't deserve to be there. They are a vendor. They're providing a service. An insurance company provides you a service. You are, yes. you are, you are, you are swapping risk profiles between yourself and the insurance company. If you want to go un uninsured, that's a business decision to make or a family decision to make on your own behalf. And the banks are doing the same thing to you. They're, they're assessing the risk level of you and whatever you're trying to accomplish and putting the price to it. If you have a lot of speeding tickets, your car insurance is higher than if you don't. And that's maybe a bad example, but it's one everyone can understand. The bank is doing the same thing. They're assessing the risk level of you and your house, you and your business, you and your office building, and making a judgment call. So one of the things that I've also always seen, again, there are very few business owners who understand how banks make decisions about loans they put out. This is especially true for operating loans or capital loans or working capital loans. Not so much for real estate, because people pretty much get that. It's pretty simple. But when you're loaning to a business for operations or growth, how important is it for the borrower, i.e. the business owner, to understand the way banks think before they get into this process? Well, I think it's important. Um, it's not necessarily, I mean, and we could talk about this question all day long and, you know, talk to bankers as well as to what, where the reality lies. Um, I think it's really important. It's, it's important in anything you do in life to assess the person you're speaking to and what point of view they're coming from. And a banker is coming from the point of view of where are the minefields here? What is the risk? Uh, how truthful is this person being? How much do they understand the nature of their own business? And you're, you're, you are putting 
you need to instill confidence in the bank that in the most simple manner, you know what you're doing. And that's why they ask you how many years in business you're in. If you've been in business for less than three years, it is a tough road to get a loan. Yeah, or if, you have a, or if you have a debt to equity ratio of 16 to one, which is what I had. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's all, every bank, and, and this is where things get interesting is not every bank is going to look at the ratios in the same way. While there are some common denominators and there's some bright line tests that are probably common to all banks. As you intimated earlier, a community bank may look slightly differently at a company than a national bank or than a credit union. And just like everyone's entitled to their own opinion, every bank is running their business as they see fit. And not every bank can compete in all the spaces. So that's where Miguel gets powerful because if I'm the president of a community bank and in my area, I keep getting beaten out by a certain type of bank, well, what am I gonna do? Well, I could shut the doors. I mean, that's one way I'm losing, right? I'm not winning. I'm winning. I'm trying to make money by lending money and to getting deposits in the door. So I might have to pivot my advertising techniques. I might have to pivot uh, the type of borrowers I'm going after. So as the borrower, how would you know which bank has pivoted to your direction? Unless you have something like your program, you just have to plainly get lucky. Exactly. And what are the odds of getting lucky with thou literally thousands of bank choices in the United States? It's impossible. Now, do you guys go past bank choices to, say, insurance companies or other lending sources, if appropriate? Uh, the platform was built to give you lending choices. So the primary purpose is to connect a borrower with an FDIC insured lender. That's how it started. And that okay. includes national banks and community banks. As the platform matures, we add uh, manually because they're not, they're not, there's no way for them to automatically use the system. We have to vet them. Sure. Uh, credit unions are not automatically in the system because they're not FDIC, FDIC insured. That doesn't mean they're bad. Of course they're not. But you know, we have the larger credit unions are in the system. We have some alternative lenders because not every loan is going to get is at the place in its life cycle. Not every business is going to be credit worthy for an FDIC insured bank. So that's OK. We have some alternatives for you. Um, and we believe that at that point, that's a lot of information to take in. Yes. And that's where the and that's the important information. That is where the money is made or lost is making a right decision with your bank. Can the system give you the similar experience for insurance? Yes, it can, but we're not doing it. What we no, are I doing. Insurance, no, I mean, insurance companies who tend to be big loaners, lenders. Oh, yes. For, oh, yeah. Real estate. Oh, okay. Yes. The answer is yes. We have, uh, and it's a great question, we have gone to uh, insurance companies and pension funds who do have. Uh, uh, an affinity for that market and the system works very very well for them because we didn't touch on this earlier but the lenders themselves set their search criteria very similar to a dating site so there's too much noise in the system there's too many loans coming through Megilla now um, it's overwhelming for a lender to have his criteria wide open so if I only want to see residential loans five million dollars and under so be it if I only want to see large commercial real estate loans in the state of Texas in excess of $50 million, I can do that too. The, so, the, system, the system allows you to be very efficient with your time. Cool. So let's say um, you get a, a company like mine, which I did, I really was at a 16 to one debt to equity ratio and my bank got redlined by the OCC the Office of Control and Currency. So they pulled me into the famous workout meeting where they basically said, we well, don't like you anymore, and they tossed me out. Now, I found a new bank to take us over because they were an asset-based loan lender who really understood cash flow. Okay. And our interest coverage was 15 times. Okay. Even though our debt-to-equity ratio really stunk, we had a great interest coverage and they loved us and they took us right away. 
Now, I had to talk to about eight or nine banks to find this one that understood A, the industry, or spent the time to understand the industry, and then understand their cash flow. Does your system automatically help people figure out, you know, I'm a 16 to 1 debt to equity, but my interest coverage would be about 15 times. Would that take that information and find a lender that would be good to have a conversation with? Uh, yes and no. Um, and um, I think you can probably tell I'm a pretty, <laughs> pretty direct person, very yes. honest person. Yeah, I, I like, uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I'd be like, uh, the system is getting more complicated with each day. We have coders in-house that are constantly enhancing the system. Yes, that is the direction that we're headed. At the same time, we're cautious to not make choices for the borrower, or in this case, the consumer. We want the consumer to ultimately make the choice. But the system is getting smarter and is getting more intelligent to, as you're answering the question trees, um, and you answer a debt coverage ratio in, in the manner that you described, that it would give you some advice and some direction. But we don't have that yet. What we do have, though, is our you know refined question tree which is responsive depending on how you answer the previous questions the future questions change you have a notes field a borrower like you who understands their business would be behoove them to just put in the notes to not again it's we don't want to waste time so what do i put in the notes be honest that's the whole point of you should ne always be honest Never oh, lie. I, I, I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. I mean, it's, yeah, what's the really point? You, you, these people aren't stupid. They're going to find, I mean, you're just going to ruin a relationship you have with a potential bank. If the bank tells you no, that's okay. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person or that you're a bad company. McGill is trying to tell you, and the bank is trying to tell you, this may just not be a good fit. When? Today, on September 12th. That changes quarterly. It changes sometimes faster than that. Just take it. It's not what you wanted to hear. There are thousands more options. And with a little bit of work, you will find one. And with the help of Megillah, you're, you have a much better chance of finding that match. But, so, you know, so, so life's not easy. I mean, this yeah, isn't no, an auto, no. it's not autopilot. I mean, you've got to, you still have to work at it. Oh, I, I get that. So, Dean, um, does Megillah, ever come back and say, look, it, you're really, this will, we'll have to end the podcast with this question and we'll continue on with our Facebook Live. But um, does McGill come back and come and say, I hate to say this to you, but you're not really very credit worthy and you're going to have a really difficult time getting a loan? Yes, it does. Okay, and it good. gives you some choices. It gives you um, uh, some choices uh, in your locale to go to to get uh, free help from the government to help you write a business plan. Uh, it gives you choices in terms of alternative lenders that may be able to take a chance on you. Um, it does give you a soft landing. It's not what people want to hear, but I always use the example of you don't get mad at Kayak when you're looking for a first class airline ticket from San Francisco to Tokyo for $400 that maybe doesn't exist, right? And you maybe thought it did because your friends said they were having a special, but you go to a kayak and it's not there. Right. Um, don't be dismayed. Um, the best, every company in the world started from nothing. And nothing being you and a desk, you and a friend and a desk. I mean, that's how we started. It's two guys and an old Macintosh and a computer. And, you know, we are where we are today. But that's okay. You can't start from, you know, banks clamoring after you to get your business. You have to work your way there and that's okay. Um, don't let those kind of, um, don't call it a rejection. It is a state of the situation on a given day. So, so, just Dean, move through it. so Dean, unfortunately we're out of time for the podcast portion of this episode. And um, I'm going to bet or I'm hoping and I'm going to strongly encourage you guys to check out McGilla. And uh, I don't know if you like to talk to people, Dean, or not. But if you do, you can give your contact information. But I really want people to know how they can find McGilla 
and start using it. And the best way is to go to magillaloans.com, M-A-G-I-L-L-A loans.com. Uh, that's the URL. You can also find it in the Apple uh, App Store and the Google Play Store. Um, and it's free. We didn't touch on this, but it's free for borrowers. Um, our compensation structure is subscription from the lenders. And that's important for the borrower to know is that we are not a transaction-based system in that by using Megillah, you're adding additional costs to an already expensive process. We really want it to be what we would want as borrowers. How do I filter the view? How do I narrow the field of view to those who are relevant? And hmm. yes, of, of course, we have to make money, but we're going to make that money through subscriptions from the banks. Okay, so I'm going to, I, I almost never do this, but I'm going to break my rules because in my world, rules are sometimes made to be broken. Anybody listening to this podcast, the first thing I want you to do when you get into your office or find yourself a computer is go to mcgillaloans.com and check this site out. It is completely unique in the world of loans. Uh, I've been doing business for over 40 years. If I had this when I was in my vending business, you would have been my best friend of all times. <laughs> so well, uh, that makes us happy. You know, that I, makes I, us happy. Yeah, there's nothing, you, to, you, this there's, is there's like, nothing you know, to lose. I, mean, I am going to be telling all my clients who borrow money to check you guys out. And uh, I may even do it myself. I also have an offer for you. I mean, part of what we talked about today is how do you create an economically and personally sustainable business? And I actually have the answer to that. It's called Success to Sustainability, the five steps you need to take to create a personally and economically sustainable business. I even made a one-hour CD about it, and it's absolutely free. All you have to do is take out your smartphone. And don't do this if you're driving, for God's sakes. When you see a stop, I ride bicycles. I don't want to get hit by a guy texting. And text the word sustainable to 44222. That's the word sustainable to 44222. And this is Josh Patrick. You've been at the sustainable business. Thanks a lot for stopping by today. I hope to see you back here really soon. And that was great. Hey, Dean, I, I, I got to tell you, I am in love with what you're doing. Well, that makes us happy. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of the things that we say when we're interviewed, like we are right now, it's, I'm sure some of the listeners are saying, well, that sounds too good to be true, or that sounds cliche, but no, it actually, is it true. doesn't sound too good to be true it, at there, all. There's I mean, nothing, but there's nothing to lose. If, I, if, I, if my bank told me something, McGill is, we're not out to break banking relationships. We're right. out to inform, to, to level the playing field at the outset of the search. And it's possible, like for myself, getting back to the car example, if I patronize, I try to patronize locally as, best, as much as I can. So if I go to cars.com and I want to buy a new Audi A4 and the Audi A4 is supposed to cost, according to cars.com, a good deal for whatever that means, you know, somewhere in the middle, it's $42,000. Right. Yeah. If I go to my local dealer, dealer and it's $42,500 or even 43, it, it's in the zone, right? For me, I'm making a judgment call that I'd rather patronize the local uh, dealer. It's close enough. Sure. And, McGill is saying something similar to your own bank. If you have a relationship with a community bank and the answer from McGill is that the community bank is giving you a fair shake, then be happy. It's not that McGill didn't work. You can't come to McGill and expect to always save money. If you happen to be at a good banker and you have a good banking relationship and you fit squarely within that bank's uh, profile, then use Megillah to make sure they sleep easy at night, that you're in a good place. That's okay. Yeah, no, I um, think that, that makes perfectly good sense to me. Um, so one of the things you want to talk about, we never did get around to it, which is often true in my uh, these short little podcasts we do, is you want to talk about uh, digital banking and online identity theft risks. Yeah. Um, what specifically did you want to talk about that? I think it's a big deal also, by the way. So what is your take on that? Well, 
it's, I think it's tough to train somebody on, I mean, there's some do's and don'ts, of course, but, you know, the, the, the um, ingenuity of the theft uh, changes over time. You know, it's a cat and mouse game with the identity thieves. Um, and I've got my own personal things that I do to try to prevent identity theft. Um, and uh, getting back to Megillah, that was built with identity theft in mind in the sense that I am, I am not going to put my name and social security number and phone number and home address into a website. I'm just not. Right. Um, and, but when we were building the first Megillah, first version of it, we said, well, if we're building it for ourselves, and I know a bank can't really get a sense of my uh, credit worthiness without knowing some of these things, how would we do it? Well, the way we did it is by not requiring your name and social security number at the outset. And in fact, we never require your name and social security number. We want you to give that information to the bank once you choose a bank. And that's one way that McGillick can help you at this outset of, of, of looking for a bank. We don't think you should be handing over your entire life to a bank before they've told you whether or not they even have the capacity to do your loan because you never get that information back again. If you give them their financial statement, your K-1s or your tax returns, in order for them to tell you even a preliminary term sheet, I don't like that. I'd like to reverse that and say, this is what I look like. Take it on faith that I'm telling you the truth. And of course, tell the truth. You're wasting your time if you don't. Right, right. Based on this information, which we know isn't everything, can you do this loan based on this information? We know it's preliminary. And what would that loan look like? And if I choose, that's a first date. We go out on the first date. And if we want to go out on a second date, then I maybe at that point would be able to willing to give you my tax returns. McGilla doesn't want them. Don't give them to us. I mean, we would treat them obviously with the utmost care. But where there's website a, there's, a, there's a relatively good risk on your part that someone might steal it. And yeah, really screw I mean, up your company. yeah. So we think that information when you send it. I mean, I do this. I encrypt the PDF. If I have to email something, I encrypt the PDF. Is that foolproof? No. But any roadblock, any bump in the road to to not make it too easy on an identity theft person. There's plenty of other people who didn't encrypt the PDF. That's, that's, it's easier for them to grab that one than yours. Mine's encrypted. So are they really right. going to take the time to break the encryption? I don't know. Probably not. Well, th thieves generally go after places that are easy, and they'll skip the hard ones. Right. So don't make it easy. Like, right. Well, that's what you're saying is don't make it easy. Make it hard, and, yeah, and you're, then like, what, you're likely to be safe. Yeah. Can I make a list of the top ten things to not make it easy? Of course I can. But just use common sense. Um, when you buy things online, use your, everyone's got a name for it, but you know, your scrubby email address, the one or a disposable one from, uh, your Gmail account, Gmail lets you make disposable addresses. Yahoo lets you make disposable addresses. Right, right. Make a disposable address. That password can be, uh, does it really matter? I don't know. It doesn't really matter, but heaven right. forbid, don't use that email or password for your bank. Just don't. And, um, you know, I was a late adopter to online banking. And here I am building a technology website here. And I was one of the people as technologically, uh, uh, I am a technophile. I love technology. And even though I have tons of technology in my life, somehow I was holding back on online banking. And my brothers and my family members used to make fun of me. They said, of all people, you're holding back. But somehow it didn't feel right to me. Yeah. And um, I use that to today. I just I'm careful with what I do. Never let the never let the computer say save password. Just don't do it. Right. Every browser wants to save your password and your username. It detects what you're doing. It's trying to save you time. Sure. Well, guess what? In this one case, I don't want to have time saver. I want to yeah. do it the hard way. I want to type in my email address. Yeah. If you're on someone else's computer. Make sure they have Google Chrome installed. Open, mm -hmm. an in, open an incognito window. It's called incognito. 
Yeah. Very simple. Open incognito window. If you're in a pinch and you have to use someone else's computer, just open an incognito window. And in that window, nothing is saved. And then when you close that window, you're, you can walk away from the computer uh, at peace. Yeah, that's great advice. Great advice. Hey, Dean, um, I've taken up enough of your time today, so I really appreciate it. Uh, folks who are still watching, and this is a site you have to check out, mcgilloloans.com. Was it M-A-G-I-L-L-A? Did I get that right, or is it 1-L? 2-L. Uh, double L. 2 L. Double L. yeah. M-A-G-I-L-L-A loans.com. Uh, I'm going to – actually, I already did check it out and found it interesting, and I highly recommend you check it out. And, again, if you want to get my one-hour free audio CD on how to create a sustainable business, and that's economically sustainable, just – Text the word sustainable to 44222. We'll ask you for your address and we'll mail it to you. And if you don't happen to have a CD player in your car anymore, which I just found out is like a thing, it's a my thing. car is almost four years old, um, just send me an email, jpatrick at askjoshpatrick.com, and I will send you the audio file that you can listen to. So thanks a lot. And I hope to see you back here really soon at the sustainable business.